Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, continued study in Ezekiel. Uh, today we're going to be doing chapter 35 and uh, 36 down to I think about verse 15 if I remember correctly. Uh, so let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you will open our hearts and make our minds and hearts receptive to your word. Help us to learn from your word, Father. Learn from the words of Ezekiel and help us to apply those words to our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let's uh, let's begin with the text and, and we'll we'll expound we'll expound upon it as we move along. Uh, Chapter 35, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against you and I will make you a desolation and a waste. Uh, so, the term to set your face against means to oppose. Um, means to oppose because it is wrong. And so, um, the Lord instructs Ezekiel to set his face against Mount Seir and prophesy. Um, Mount Seir, of course, is a reference to the capital of Edom. Um, if you don't remember... Uh, from previous lessons, Edom was the most tenacious enemy Israel ever had. Edom, the Edomites, are descended from Esau, who was Jacob's brother. Um, and so this is therefore the Lord's words to the children of Esau, the Edomites, and all those living in the land at the time of this prophecy. Uh, continuing on, I will lay your cities waste, and you shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel is to speak directly and to make known to the Edomites that the Lord God of Israel is going to lay waste to their cities and to the point, <clears throat> excuse me, that the land will be made desolate. And then the Edomites will know that Israel's God is God. And the cause for this punishment is also to me made clear to them. We continue on. Verse 5. Here's the reason. Because you cherished perpetual enmity and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will prepare for you I will prepare you for blood and blood shall pursue you because you did not hate bloodshed therefore blood will pursue you I will make Mount Seir a waste and a desolation and I will cut off from it all who come and go and I will fill its mountains with the slain on your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines those slain with the sword shall fall I will make you a perpetual desolation, and your cities shall not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord. This is uh, incredible. The reason God is doing this is what he calls their cherished perpetual enmity against Israel. And as we have uh, discussed in other lessons, enmity means hatred to the point that the person desires to see the object of hatred annihilated. So God is basically saying you, Edom, are to be annihilated because this is what you desired for my people. Now the manner in which this comes to pass is irrelevant. Could be natural disaster, could be plague, could be could be any anything or it could be a supernatural event 
But through this prophecy, God wants the Edomites to know that when it comes, by whatever means, He personally has caused it to happen. And the reason for this and the nature of how it will come about is in direct relation to how the Edomites behaved toward Israel and Judah when it was conquered by the Babylonians, and in the case of Israel, previous to the Babylonians, the Assyrians. Continuing on verse 10, Because you said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will take possession of them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will deal with you according to the anger and envy that you showed because of your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, the scriptures make it clear that is, it is the Lord who raises nations up and casts them down. It also makes it clear he does so at his pleasure alone. Uh, however, often he reveals the causes for this when it involves apostate behavior. Edom is a land whose inhabitants have opposed the people of God and therefore have opposed God. And in ancient cultures, their gods were believed in amongst the, the, the nations, uh, not Israel, but amongst the nations. Their gods were believed to be tied to the land. So it may be that the Lord is saying to the Edomites, in effect, I made the land of Israel a desolation because they did not obey me. But it was not up to you, therefore, to take possession of the land that I promised to Israel. That land is mine, even though the whole earth is his and everything in it. When he says, although the Lord was there, it's in effect saying, that land was mine, and I did not give it to you. You were arrogant and foolish to think that you could take it while I am, while I am there. Um, we continue on. I have heard all the revilings that you uttered against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given to us to devour. And you magnified yourselves against me with your mouth, and multiplied your words against me. I heard it. Thus says the Lord God, While the whole earth rejoices, I will make you desolate. As you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so I will deal with you. You shall be desolate, Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So Edom is being judged for its presumption and for its blaspheming of the one true living God. Notice God wants Edom to know, I heard you when you were saying all those things. That ought to cause us to pause and think about all the blaspheming that goes on on the streets in our culture, on the TV set in our culture, in the halls of power in our culture. This God of ours is living and He hears and he will judge. And this is all the more unforgivable because of its close familial association with Israel. So Edom, by nature of being cousins, if you will, to Israel, should have known better. Instead of being mortal enemies, Edom ought to have learned of the oracles of God from their cousin Israel. This ought to cause every nation on earth to take pause, but as they do not, we see how truly the scriptures reveal the darkened hearts and minds are of reprobate nations. Uh, we ought to have known better than to allow our culture to deteriorate as it has when dealing with the living God. And I personally am very concerned that America is heading for the trash heap. We need to pray that God will be merciful and bring revival on this nation. Let us pray He will use us to be a light to our community and lift it up out of the darkness before it is too late. Let's look at chapter 36. 
And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy said of you, Aha! And the ancient heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Precisely because they made you desolate and crushed you from all sides, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations, and you became the talk, and ev- uh, you became the talk and evil gossip of the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains and the hills, the ravines and the valleys, the desolate wastes and the deserted cities, which have become a prey and derision to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Surely I have spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and utter contempt, that they might make its pasture lands a prey. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealous wrath, because you have suffered the reproach of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I swear that the nations that are all around you shall themselves suffer reproach. So despite the reality that we know uh, Judah went into captivity because of a sovereign act of God, this does not remove responsibility from the nations surrounding it in how they acted. In fact, their coming judgment, God says, is precisely because of how they reacted. Instead of being filled with reverent fear of a holy God who would punish his covenant people in this way for having flagrantly defied him, they instead rejoiced at Israel's fall and seized the promised land for their own. Continuing on, verse 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply people on you, the whole house of Israel, all of it. The city shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt and I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall multiply and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times, and will do more good to you than ever before. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I will let people walk on you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess you, and you shall be their inheritance and you shall no longer bereave them of children. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour people and you bereave your nation of children, therefore you shall no longer devour people and no longer bereave your nation of children, declares the Lord God. And I will not let you hear any more the reproach of the nations, and you shall no longer bear the disgrace of the peoples and no longer cause your nation to stumble, declares the Lord. So God declares to the land, and actually by extension the house of Israel, that they will return home. The the people will return to the promised land. There will be an end to his wrath, and the people will return and increase. And God will not allow them to be disgraced or reproached by the nations around them any longer. So note that this text removes all possibility of the return of the people to the land being rationalized as something political or something that happens in the course of nations carrying out their policies. No, no. Over and over, God says through Ezekiel, I will do it, and then you will know that I am the Lord. Both to the house of Israel and to the nations, God is concerned that all will understand his sovereignty and will reverently fear him. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, 
we ask that you will help us take to heart the things we have learned in this study of Ezekiel. I am, I am worried, Father, that there are too many people in this country who do not think this country can fall, who do not understand that you judge nations, who have no fear of you because of what has been done in this land. Lord, I pray these words from the study of Ezekiel will impose themselves on our hearts and minds. They will stick fast and form our prayers for this nation and will have a bearing on how we conduct ourselves in, and will increase our reverent fear of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.